Well, first, Father Mariani, uh, let me just tell you how delighted that I am, that we are, all of us who are working on this project, to be uh, interviewing you. We're, we're just happy that you agreed to be interviewed in this series, which, as you know, is a series of prominent scholars who have researched and published on the history of the, of the church in China, Christianity in China. And uh, one of the, the things that came to mind as, as we were discussing sort of uh, the, the group of scholars, and that is that you really are a pioneer. And so that's why I'm particularly uh, uh, honored because you know, the study of post-1949 Christianity in China is something that 15 years ago was almost unimaginable. Everyone was, as you know, publishing on your confrères, you know, Matteo Ricci and Adam Chalvan Bell and Fernand, Fernand Verbeest. And then suddenly you open this whole new terra incognita where you start publishing on post-1949. And uh, you, you've given a lot of talks, you've published a great a number of you've published articles. One of my favorites is your article on the six, the six Chinese bishops who were consecrated in Shanghai in 1926. But really, I mean, what I see happening all the time is that you're cited constantly. Uh, your book, A Church Militant, is constantly cited. And that book is, uh, I hear that book mentioned constantly. In fact, I've cited that book many times, sure, right? Sure. Which is about uh, Shanghai in the 1950s and Catholic resistance. So um, with that, um, it, the goal here really is to let you do the talking, but, uh, but I just wanted to acknowledge that you really are one of the pioneers in this field of post-1949 Christianity in China. But, but we're asking everyone more or less the same questions. Uh, and the first question, Father Mariani, is, is what brought you to the field of Christianity in China studies? And maybe you could mention a little bit about why you've chosen to study the, or research the areas in particular that you've found interest in. Yeah, I appreciate that. And thank you for that's kind of nice of you to call me a pioneer in that. I Maybe we could talk about that later. Um, yeah, there's a story there in the, after 1949, and some always felt it was too delicate. But, uh, you know, uh, fools go where angels dare to, uh, fear to tread. So I went right into it, and uh, it was extremely uh, uh, rewarding. You know, the, my interest in China, you know, I was born in 1965. In fact, interestingly enough, I'm here in the the bedroom, it's changed a bit that I, I kind of grew up in, in uh, visiting with my folks this summer. And uh, so I even have a book over here in the shelf of the Chinese military machine, 1979. So China's kind of coming out into the, you know, into the world again, the reform and opening. So I kind of date my interest to China, interestingly enough, uh, to the late 70s. And I don't know if I, you know, precocious or anything, but I was kind of interested in this very different place on the opposite end of the world. And growing up in a more rural area near the University of Massachusetts in uh, Western Mass, um, China was on, you know, literally on the other side of the world. And I remember a very strange thing uh, a, a teacher asked me or told me when I was uh, in second grade was, you know, one, one of one of my classmates in second grade was wearing like the same clothes every day. And I don't think you could get away with this today. It was kind of harsh, but the teacher said, you know, you're wearing the same clothes every day. You should be in China where they wear the, I thought well, that's a really strange thing to say, but I think she was pointed to the Maoist period where even, even not today, but I think, well, maybe, maybe when we were in China, you could still see some of the old timers, the Navy, the blue or the olive gray. Right. So, it kind of piqued my interest. What is this place? The Vietnam War was going on at that time, you know, so it, it kind of informed my, my memory a bit. So 1978-9, Deng Xiaoping comes to the United States, and since UMass is nearby, uh, I go to the local mall, and they have a little setup, a booth, and they say uh, Chinese lessons. So I thought I, I'd try that. I'd go for some Chinese lessons for my 14th birthday, and uh, I did, a handful. It was really one of those uh, Saturday uh, Chinese schools for the children of scholars and professors. And then there were two Caucasian students who were kind of taken aside and maybe we could do some calligraphy. I don't know how seriously they took us, but it was my first exposure. Well, actually, uh, just quickly, my first exposure was my great aunt. And I still, I have some of her boxes. She just died a few years ago. She had no children, so she took us under her wings, and uh, she took us to a, a Chinese restaurant down the street from her apartment in, in Manhattan. So that was probably my earliest. So I had, kind of had these interesting connections. Um, 
you know, later on, you find out things like uh, my great grandmother, it makes sense among some Italian or Italian Americans, they kind of had the little, the, 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 uh, the box set of Chinese goods, right? So, so that, that exotic material. So all of that, basically, that's my interest in China. And then of course, Christianity, and then that, that, that goes over the years, my first year at, at Harvard, freshman year, I take one year of Chinese, I don't continue with it. And then when I graduate, I'm not really sure what I want to do. And that is the year of the Tiananmen, 18, 1989, June. I'm not going to Beijing now, it's pretty clear. So I go to Taiwan. And then I went to China for the first time in 1990. And then I entered the Jesuits in 91. So all of that's kind of coming together. So I've had a long history, interest in China, uh, baptized, lifelong Catholic. Uh, and so my idea was try to bring the two together. And I even thought of entering the Jesuits in Taiwan it's just that I think it would have been a little bit too, uh, too high of a bar to enter religious life, do something totally new and different, and on the other side of the world. So I joined the California province, which is a, had the mission connection with China for the longest time, and something that I enjoyed. And so I entered there, and maybe even with the thought that I might leave my China interest behind, because once you join a religious order, they might put you somewhere else. But in fact, they encouraged my interest. Some years later, the, the, the Father General in Rome left, put China as one of the top five uh, priorities. So um, I really did not start researching deeply until my doctoral dissertation in 2002. The only other major connection I would say is I would meet some of the old China missionaries here or there but probably the one that um, my interest was already there, but he helped to encourage it was Father Ed Mahler Testa, who set up the Ricci Institute. You know, he has an interesting story in itself. You know, he had taught in Rome all those years, but as a young 17 year old Jesuit, he wanted to go to China and it was 1949. And so people are leaving and he can't get in, but 20 something years later, almost 20 years later, he decides to follow that interest. So he would kind of be um, an animator, so to speak. And he would speak to novices or people in formation. So that's how I kind of kept those two things uh, together. What's interesting to me in that answer is, first off, being in China in 1990, that's still in the wake of Tiananmen, right? So you right. must have seen the ripples a little bit of that event sort of in the context that you were within. Yes, uh, you know, people would talk about uh, surprising or interesting things. One was just the spirit of the people in Beijing. Mm -hmm. And then others, it was clear that we're not going to talk about it. But you could see that, you know, you know, I was only in Beijing a few days. So, but I did meet, a, 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 I, I had dinner with a family just because things were, I think, sort of open then, you know, as a foreigner, you're kind of interesting. So I, I struck up a conversation with someone and then I went to their family for dinner and they talked about the spirit of the people in Beijing. And then years later, I saw them in New York. <laughs> so you know, figure that out. <laughs> right, right. Well, well, the next question is, is uh, one that, that, that focuses on research. Um, interestingly, you've had experience on the ground in China and you've had a lot of experience in archives. So, I mean, you know, you've seen China from the sort of in the pews and on the ground and in the archives and in the documents. But I wonder if you might uh, have an experience researching as a historian wherein you learned something that made you think differently or changed your mind about your topic. Right, I, I had thought about that question. I think it's a great question. And um, there, there's always great research discovery. So like with Church Militant, I had written up the story or I knew that these old mission magazines existed and then there was this whole kind of Cold War literature about, you know, the communist Chinese is the enemy, et cetera. And then um, I went to the archives in, in the California Jesuit archives and I found a sheaf of uh, letters from McCarthy, right? So that's it. This guy, he kind of blow by blow account because some, some guys were not as, he was trained as a journalist, right? As, as you know, and uh, so he wrote this great material and I said, now I can really do the dissertation. So that was a major breakthrough. And then a second major breakthrough was, um, you know, 
the Shanghai Municipal Archives documents. So that said, now I can, I have it mostly written, but I can, I can get it from the party point of view, which a lot of books had lacked. So that really helped a great deal. I would also say that in terms of a research discovery was more, um, I was challenged like after I had written the dissertation and I was trying to publish the book, someone, you know, when I was at the University of Chicago, I went back and I talked to a professor. He actually teaches uh, basically Russia, but um, he challenged me. He said, you know, this is good, uh, but it's, it's still a lot like a dissertation, meaning church state issues are, are, are everywhere in European history. You know, look at the French, the Third Republic, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I don't know if I wanted to hear that as much, but I think it informed me a lot because, you know, as, as you know, is when we work on our dissertations, we really have to, you know, sit in the seat, hunker down and plow away. But occasionally, you know, it's good to come up for air and see the bigger picture. And I think as we mature as scholars, we start to see a bigger picture. And so sometimes I try to go as far afield as, you know, me, biblical things, stuff from Shakespeare, that can kind of, you can't just read that, you're not a Shakespeare scholar, right? You can't, but sometimes it helps us a little bit to kind of imagine a bigger picture. And I would say that, so for example, church militant, um, you know, on the one hand, the party is structured as a secret underground organization, and then it becomes the government. So is it any surprise that their documents are heavily militarized, you know, using words like attack, counterattack, the enemy, divide and uh, disrupt, you know, command and control, like all these words are pretty much in there. I'm not really putting a flourish on it. So is it a surprise that they use that kind of rhetoric? And therefore, is it is a surprise that sort of the church without violence sort of mirrored some of those techniques of, of uh, you know, group cohesion, uh, pressure campaigns, and that's all documented in the book. But I think seeing the bigger picture that we can't forget that by that point of the early 50s, China had been through World War II, which lasted longer there. It had been through the uh, Civil War. So to think that suddenly that history just disappears. So context, I would say, I mean, context is key, right? We say that a lot, but to actually see it, you know? So like today we're talking, it's interesting, we're talking on Zoom, the digital revolution, right? This would not have been possible some years ago, but it's not just a new technology, it kind of informs the way we do things, right? So to leave that part of, out of the equation in doing Christianity in China, I think would be wrong as well. So context, I think, the more I think about it has been very important. Well, you mentioned the Shanghai Municipal Archives, and you mentioned your 1990 trip to, or 1980, 1990 trip to China and your time in Taiwan. Um, you know, I, I wonder if you might sort of expand a little bit on a particular experience you've had in China, could be Taiwan, could be anywhere or multiple times, um, but could sort of maybe mention a particular moment you've had in China that was meaningful to you, and even if it's beyond research or in the, in the domain of research. Right. You know, I never told you the story, but this, this just happened uh, the summer before last. I went back, I had to compress things. Um, I think it was 2018. And uh, I was back in, in Hong Kong, but then I went into Shanghai. That's right, the whole trade war was starting. So it was odd, I was getting a new visa. And I don't know, Tony, you would know better than that, but like, every time I turned around in the visa office, like the price was going up and down. Like literally they were on a phone and well, multiple is this much, but the price is, and so I was wondering like if it was all happening at that time, because usually it's a set price, right? Right, right. So that was very odd. But anyway, I went into Shanghai and I had actually talked to, you know, I had met people over the years, but I had talked to someone who was a seminarian at the time. And um, what happened was that he, he was arrested in 1955. Then I think he was let out and I think he was uh, labeled a anti-rightist, but if he had been labeled, I guess, a counter-revolutionary, he would have been in big trouble. But it was, because actually what he did 
is he said, Bishop Kong is a counter-revolutionary, which technically I guess was true because he was against elements of the revolution, right? But anyway, he's still a very practicing Catholic. And um, he, you know, he had worked on some of my book. He had translated, uh, you know, stuff. And he said, I was very moved. We were just sitting at some Starbucks and, and uh, I was very moved. He said, uh, every word in your book is true. And like, for a scholar, like, I mean, for someone who writes on this, just that's, that's such a high compliment that like, he says, and I wouldn't have spent so much time working on it and working, you know, reading it if it weren't true. And uh, the other thing was, there were people in the book who were imprisoned in 55 or 56 or 57 that never knew the last couple of years. You know, it's kind of like you graduate from high school, so you never see the yearbooks that come after you, right? But there was a history there. So it's like kind of going back and reading the yearbook a year ahead or year, two years ahead. So I was very moved. And then he said, but you left out two stories. Well, I couldn't have known these two stories. He experienced them. One was simply in 1953 when they're at Christ the King Parish and the police come or the, the army comes with their machine guns and they're blocking it off. And then the young Catholics are kneeling at their feet, praying the rosary. He said he looked up because he was, he was one of those Catholics and he could see the tears coming down the soldier's eyes, which makes sense, right? Because they have a job to do, but they're human beings and they just see these are kids. These are not, you know, hardened members of the Guomindang or something like that, right? So, he, he was shedding tears. And then he, the other thing he said, this is what I love about this kind of history is there's always a, a mystical dimension, right? So he had this, he had these dreams where we would hear like the pattering of feet back and forth, back and forth. And he said, he never knew what it was. And then one night in September 8th, 9th, He's woken up in the middle of the night and it's the, the police coming in to, arrest, you know, bring them in from there. So he had a kind of a premonition, I think, that this kind of thing might happen. And that's what that sound was. So, I mean, those kind of, uh, those kind of things are just priceless, right? That when you, when you see it all come together and, you know, you, you have some humility, you know, this is, this is, uh, um, I think inherently interesting. I mean, other historians find this for inheriting, inherently interesting. Interesting, um, you know, it's it's maybe not always going to hit the top of the bestseller charts, but for a certain group or niche of people who have their eyes open, this is great material and right. compelling material. And I think what you and I try to do is 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 keep it rooted in the scholarship. You know, we write history, not hagiography, right? right but sometimes right. the material is so good that I think there's a broad mass appeal as well. You know, I should say, just before I go on to the next question, that in my, in my own classes, uh, I've taught the history of Christianity in China, and they'll read these texts, you know, they'll read Jonathan Spence, Memory Palace, yeah. they'll read all these texts. But there's something compelling about your book that when my students are reading Church Militant, they're like, I can see pictures of these people. I mean, yeah. I, it's, it's within it, it's, it's, I can envision it, right? So there's something compelling about the fact that you open this new this new ground and and even recently I was uh, I interviewed Chloe Starr who yes. one of the people she dedicated her book on Chinese theology to was someone that in a way you brought I think to her attention that's Beta Zhang. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So you see that as as that one of the dedications of her book. So there's something powerful, right, in like what you write about, and that is people within living memory. Right. You know, later on, I, I thought about that church militant, and this, this should have been something I asked myself from the very beginning. <laughs> you write a book, right? But like, what is the subject of the book? It's the church, right? So I think you and I have talked, like, it was hard to get a lot of material on Bishop Kung himself. I got some stuff, but he came in and out of focus. But the real story was the entire church, right? So that I found fascinating. It wasn't just the bishop. It wasn't just this one, you know, lone ranger out there. Because so many of our even Catholic or Christian stories are about the one individual, right? But the community is crucial. So uh, that really uh, 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 helped fill it in for me that the subject was the church and it was a story from beginning, middle and end. It fit very, very nicely into something understandable. Because early on, when I was looking at different issues uh, for possibilities for the dissertation, 
you know, there's some fa false leads out there, right? There's good material, but it's hard to get it into a understandable form. It's not a sociological study, right? I'm not doing field research in that regard, but this kind of just partially fell into my lap and then I had to, yeah, work at it. But no, I appreciate that because uh, I get some of the same from my students as well, that they found that a compelling story. Now, I'm the teacher of the class, maybe they're just flattering me, but I do, I do feel that, you know, I teach for a, a semester, a quarter, so it's 10 weeks and uh, students don't always read everything on the list, let's say that. So I really, I say, you know, you have to read Church Militant and then this other material. And then we can have good conversations about it, right? Because they, they, right. they, they've invested in it. Right, well, okay, so we still, we still have two more questions, but yes. speaking of living memory, um, you met someone of great significance and that is you personally met Gong Pinmei. Yes, yes, so I can tell you a little bit about that. Um, um, I have, I, I usually write these things up in my journals. Okay, I can tell you when it was. I believe it was Chinese New Year, so the end of January or early February, 1995, and there was a Jesuit. It's interesting, like, you know, I'm a Jesuit. I've been a Jesuit now almost 30 years. It's hard to believe, but even sometimes it's hard to, to figure out what the heck the Jesuits were doing in China during those periods. So the best I can figure out was there were kind of two tracks. Maybe this is confidential information or whatever, but for the longest time, now everything, you know, with the Sino-Vatican Accord, it's a different moment. But I think what there was, was there were some Jesuits that really tried to help and to shore up, quote, the underground church, because it's not the underground church, they're Catholics and their fellow Jesuits. And so they're trying to help them and get them money and make sure they're not starving and that they can do some ministry. And on the other hand, there's these more official official links. So I think those were the two, uh, two big things going on during that period. So basically, this one Jesuit, Franco Belfiore, he came to the US to meet, uh, to see again, Cardinal Kung. Uh, yes, Cardinal Kung at that point, because he had been named, he was named in Pector in 1979 by John Paul, and then that became official in 91. So I saw him in 95. At that point, he was at the rest home for clergy in Stanford, Connecticut. And, uh, you know, it was interesting. We knelt for a blessing and Franco Belfort, he basically really wanted to know about how his priests were doing in Shanghai. He really stayed away from anything political. Um, it was interesting. It was clear that um, he really did not have much English. I'm sure he had some words, but he really did not speak it. Um, um, and he, he, he did not really, Bei Fong Hua, he called the Mandarin. So he wasn't really too interested in speaking Mandarin or, but basically it was Shanghaiese, yeah. French, and then uh, uh, Latin, church Latin. So the prayers he, he would do in Latin. So it makes sense. That was the, he was a product of that time. So, um, but it, I am glad I went. And I basically, he needed a ride. Uh, this Jesuit needed a ride up there and I had access to a car and I had interest in China. So we went and now, you know, um, I never saw him again, right? You know, uh, uh, you know, he died by 2000, and I think 2000, right? Or 2001. So that was a great mo movement. And then also some of his family members I have met. So that was, uh, you know, it's interesting, you know, you and I study history and we think, oh, that's no big deal. That just happened yesterday. But, you know, like our trip to China was already 10 years ago. Right, right. <laughs> 10, not, not three. <laughs> Not, 10 not years ago, time, time goes very quickly. <laughs> so we, and, and, then, and then for a while I was thinking, you know, there's not a lot of people doing Christianity in China because I'm sure when we were in graduate school, 2000, when I was there in 2002, you had to look and look and look for people doing Christianity in China yeah. or the more modern, at least, you know, and there weren't many. And since then, a lot of people have come up, right? There's a, there's a right. list mm -hmm. and, and you're interviewing many of them, which I think is great. But, uh, you know, who knows? I mean, where do we go? You know, it could get bigger right. or could contract. Right, right. Well, that, that figures into our last question. But before the last question, um, we've asked everyone if they could recall. I mean, obviously, we, we're most interested in what you have to say about your own experience. But we've asked everyone to recall a, a memory about another scholar, something that, um, yeah. that you think is significant and should be remembered to our field. Right. So... 
you know, honestly, I was thinking, you know, you meet great scholars along the way. And sometimes people have a tangential interest in Christianity China. You meet them for a few conferences or workshops, and then they go in a different direction. But I really think the one that has stood the test of time, honestly, was our trip to China because we were talking, you know, eating, breathing, speaking Chinese, right? So like on the ground, it's kind of maybe unremarkable, right? You you get up, you're sweating, you know, you have a few uh, manto, uh, you try to get a driver, you know, and, and, and it's hit or miss. And then maybe like you and I, we went with a list of things we, in our mind we wanted to do. And then sometimes it takes us in a different direction, right? And we learn new things like, um, I think I was able to show you some of the urban Catholicism in Shanghai. You've never been to Shanghai before, I've never right? Never been to Shanghai. But, yeah. And you're there, like this is a pretty cool place. It's like a, it's a blend of China and France or something like that, right? I can, I can mm -hmm. have my coffee and, right. you know, open my MacBook and then do some research. So that is great. And then I got to see some of the rural communities because, I mean, you can go to those places, but, and the first instance. You get to those villages, you can't see you can't see the church building. It's squat. It's surrounded by a compound of houses. I mean, you know, that was your genius to, to know the people who could get us there, right? And sometimes it was like, you know, like driving through any American city without GPS back in the old days. Like there's a, a well-known church in this town. Well, how are you gonna find it unless you have some local knowledge? So that was um, very powerful just to be able to to talk to you about those experiences, to experience them. And, uh, you know, it's a workout, right? I mean, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and, uh, and China, and especially going inland. But I think that was a powerful experience because you and I are very clearly interested in the church in China. And, and we're also interested in seeing it thrive and grow, right? So those kind of really mesh together. You know, it wasn't simply an academic interest. And then also to see like, not simply um, maybe the high, because there's, there's great research materials, but also to see um, the, um, the reality, even the gritty reality on the ground, right? So for example, the stories um, uh, that one pastor in Shanxi about well, the boxers were here, but then the Virgin Mary came and walked her. And then you looked at me and said, this story is the same across the whole right. North China plain. <laughs> so you're not putting it down. You're saying like, this is part of the, the oral history. So at a certain at a certain point, like, is it true or not? Like, it matters as a historian, but the people, it, it keeps coming up. And that's just fascinating to me. So like... Um, to be able to kind of process some of those experiences. Um, yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah, uh, stuff. One, one thing that, that fascinates me about, about uh, particularly that experience since you conjured it, I didn't know that you would conjure that experience, but I remember contemplating uh, the difference in access that you have uh, to the topic that you study uh, compared to someone who is a completely you know, secular academic because I remember you're, you're obviously doing research in China, but we would go to a village and a sick woman would ask for your blessing. Oh, right. You would go to another village and uh, a whole line of people would ask for your blessing. Right. You would go to another village and then the Chinese priest would ask you to, you know, help him with mass. And, uh, and I remember, and then we go to another village and a, and a Catholic family would hand you a, an old Sprite bottle with holy water and ask you to bless their house, you know? I, I know. And so, I mean, this is, a, this is a way of seeing the living church in China in a way that so many people, scholars, just don't have access to. So to me, that was a, a very um, significant view into how your particular scholarship can provide a view that other scholars cannot provide. Right. Yeah, no, I appreciate that because we had a number of these grace-filled experiences where, you know, we, you know, what's, what's happening here, you know? Um, and uh, I think that was just remarkable, right? I mean, and even to the, the point where some of the, uh, some funny things that happened, right? Uh, um, uh, the layers of history, we were going up in, uh, I think Dunger ago, up, up the hill to the seven sorrows, right? And uh, that guy, 
he was just like, you know, I, I have uncles like him, just rank and file Catholics, you know, and it's clear he's been drinking a bit, right? He's opening up, he's opening up that, that he's going to open up like an entertainment complex for pilgrims, right? Mm -hmm. So, but meanwhile, you know, he's, and then he kind of smiles, he looks at me, and you know, I'm dressed in street clothes. It's China, you don't want to draw attention to yourself. And he says, you know, well, Bu Chung Ren, like, you know, if you're not wearing the collar, I, I'm not going to recognize you as a priest. <laughs> He's half kidding, but it's also kind of like, it just shows you uh, the reality on the ground. So right. there were, and then remember the time we were in this uh, church and they kind of made it, uh, it was obviously all amateur. Like they, they had done the work themselves, I think the construction. And then they had in the ceiling, like, this script, it made absolutely no sense. Like it wasn't Latin, it wasn't English. It was like a, it was like a scrambled alphabet, right? Un unless it was something we don't know, but like, right? And then, right. and then there's right. churches we went to where you look at it and it's, it's kind of like you know, Yogi Berra says deja vu all over again. Oh yeah, this is based on a model of um, a church in Paris, right? I mean, sometimes they would just do the, the size, and you think, yeah, it kind of looks like that. I mean, it, it's not, didn't take a hundred years to build, but it, it the brickwork, and it, it's in that shape, right? Right, the, the so, red brick Sacre Coeur. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Sacre Coeur, that was the one. Right. Yeah, you know, uh, I think of it also like, uh, one thing I think for another scholar that you, were, uh, you, you helped me realize a bit too was, you know, when we're trying to get tenure and we have to publish, so a lot is on the text, right? If, if, it, does, if it doesn't produce a publication, it's no, but you really taught me, I think, the power of an image. You know what I mean? The power of an, an image of, uh, of uh, you know, and, and I think that speaks volumes too. For example, I use that book occasionally, Spence's book, Modern, Modern China, but it's a, pic, it's a picture book. Right. I think, it's, but he has those pictures from that Italian Jesuit um, wearing almost like Taoist garb, but those are powerful images. So Spence is using them. I think they're good enough for us too, right? right? I mean, right. The missionary right. photos are very powerful to see the church, you know, in action. Well, we have about 10 more minutes, just sure. maybe it's a little bit more. Um, <laughs> we've, we've asked everyone to, ask, to answer one for final question, and maybe it's the most hackneyed question, but it's a lot of emerging scholars in this field have said, well, I wonder what the more established people will say to this. That is, what are your hopes for the field? Okay, so again, I had a chance to kind of go over this in advance, and there were two things. One is, I would like to see a lot of Western scholars involved, and it goes without saying, I would like to see more and more Chinese scholars, because I think that is, um, crucial. And I think there are these, I, I got an email today even like, you know, to, to, um, I think uh, Nicholas Standard does this and others, right? They train a new generation. So I think that that's crucial to get Chinese scholars. And some of it uh, is becoming very, very good, you know, that they really have access to sources. They know the language, you know, much better. And um, uh, sometimes they're Christian themselves. So that's very important. Because some of the old scholarship quotes, some of it wasn't even scholarship, right? It was simply, you know, how to make the church look bad. They're kind of these quick little books out there, right? The other thing is, I hope the level of scholarship keeps getting better and better. Um, and it is getting better. And, um, um, and I hope it stays active. My only fear is, it seems like we're, we're kind of in a period of tightening again, like it's harder to get into the archives. Um, so um, I think that's why this project is so important because you, I, I think I was talking to one scholar and they say, you, you always go by the one shot rule, meaning like if you have the opportunity to, to um, you know, to, to uh, take those photos then or to write that then or to get this material now and take it because you may not get that again. And I think you have, I have seen where like, oh yeah, that's just on the top shelf. That's no worries. You go back, it's gone, right? And no one knows what you're talking about. Right, like right. I found this little thing in, the Hong, in Hong Kong about Laszlo Ladani, right? The great China watcher. 
And um, so I took a few pictures. I was tired. I was sweating it up. So I took a few pictures of a letter he wrote. But like, no one knows where that little box went. It wasn't a lot of information. They'll, they'll all say, oh, that went to, see, I'm getting all excited about this. All, all his stuff went to Taiwan. Well, that might be true, but I was here four years ago or whatever, and there was a, like a, a cabinet with some stuff in it, maybe left behind. No one knows. <laughs> right? so, so maybe, maybe no one would have ever done anything with that material. But for the very least, I'm glad I took a picture. It's somewhere of one letter he wrote. And I think it's important because it basically, it makes sense that he's basically bemoaning the fact that he's no longer in China and what can he do for the rest of his life? Well, he goes on to, if I, if I read the letter right, he goes on to found the China's news analysis, which was a, a major China watching um, circular for so long. But you can see him as a young priest, a young man, maybe, maybe quirky in his own way. And they, you know, what is he gonna do? So um, I just say that uh, I hope people just stay in it, stay in the fight and keep researching no matter what happens because there's this great history there. Yeah, I suspect your hopes are, are the seeds of their realization are already growing. But I do, I do share your lament in this new apparent tightening. Um, uh, well, then let me just find, finally ask something that you may not expect, and that is, what, what is Father Paul Mariani's next step? Right. So I, uh, I had uh, written a few articles. It seems they go around the bishops, right? So, and then there's that six bishops article, which I, I, I wrote some years ago, which I found interesting. And then I tried a popular pre, a piece. I think at that point, you were in Shanghai, so you put me in touch with Catholic World Report, Charles Olson, right? Carl, yeah. Carl, Carl. Yeah, so I did a short piece on Cardinals. And at first we wanted it to be a full length interview, but it was hard to do it on the phone. And uh, Cardinals is already in his, nine, I think probably 90 or so. So that didn't work, but I could review his book and that helped. In fact, I saw him in New York briefly. So there's that. And then, you know, I'm trying to, I'm working on something now, just trying to look more at the 1980s. So the reform and opening and, and Bishop Jin. And, and, and again, like we just said, oh, that's just recent material and there's gobs of stuff. But then when you start really looking at it, yeah, there's a lot of stuff, but even the people who remember the 80s now are passing away, right? Let a, forget the 50s, most of them are gone and they're still around, some of them, but they were, they were teenagers. But even the 80s are becoming distant. That's already 40, almost 40 years ago. And the Sino-Vatican Accord had kind of changed some of the chemistry. So I think I'm just trying to, you know, not try to make a great narrative about into the future, but look at what happened to the church when it opened up once again, because that's a compelling story. Maybe, I don't know, not as compelling as the 50s where there's a big clash between church and state, but it's compelling. Like the church is basically destroyed, right? It's gone. People are in prison. People are scared. The buildings are taken. And then what comp so the word there might in the first book was kind of more resistance but now compromise how far do you compromise how much how little do you completely stay away from any company like, so what do you do i think those are some of the issues mm -hmm. well we certainly look forward to that and uh, and i think that i mean this whole idea of resistance i almost say restoration too as part of right. that, that era of compromise father mariani we are out of time but we are just so grateful. And I know that everyone working on this project wants to wish you a very good summer. Yes. Uh, during this time. I, will you be in Boston for the rest of the summer or? Yeah, I'm, we I'm west of Boston, but I'll be here for a bit visiting with my family. And then we'll see. I mean, uh, you know, people look at this years from now and say, oh, that was the summer with that horrific coronavirus. Right, you know, right. The uncertainty. And uh, um, so, you know, we live, but <laughs> we walk by faith, right? Right, right. Father, thank you so much. We are deeply grateful. Thank you. Thank you.